right. Hey, thanks to everyone who's joined us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's the top of the hour, 2 p.m. here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, my name is Tad Johnson. I'm from Jamf, and I'm joined here with Amy Simpson from Code42, and we have a very special guest, Matt Peterson uh, from Tableau. Today, the topic is we're going to hear from Matt a little bit about how their IT group manages user choice at Tableau, meaning uh, giving their, their users a choice between uh, Mac and Windows PCs, and how that, what that means for an IT operations standpoint. Then we're going to talk more about uh, deployment goals and challenges, migration tips uh, for both Code42 and Jamf, and then putting it all together. And we'll end with some Q&A at the back end of this uh, session. So if you do have questions, please send them in throughout the, uh, throughout the webinar today. As a brief introduction, I mentioned I'm from Jamf. Uh, what, what do we do here at Jamf? Our, our mission is simple. We help organizations succeed with Apple. So as groups like Tableau are rolling out Mac, iOS, and iPad to their users, uh, Jamf is the tool that can help to make that process really simple. And in a single image, uh, this is really what we do. We handle all of the steps that are involved in getting a new Apple device set up with all the software it needs, all the configurations, and ready to use from the user. So with Jamf, you can do your deployment, your configurations, security, inventory, and then app management and patching. As it relates to today's topic, we're going to uh, talk about how you can actually deploy Code42, the crash plan utility, uh, using Jamf, and that makes for a really smooth uh, deployment model for folks like Tableau. So first, I'm going to hand it over to Amy uh, for a, a little introduction of Code42. Amy, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Tad. So yeah, what Code42 does is our um, application crash plan really helps um, IT teams gain control over their end-user data. So on all operating systems, um, Mac, PC, Linux, we are um, deployed as an application on those endpoints, basically helping solve challenges related to security, visibility, and recovery. So what we allow IT teams to do is really recover um, in real time from things like just one-off um, user error. We help recover after ransomware. We help streamline kind of migration from one device to another. And then also provide additional visibility into user activity to really help after some security incidents or, you know, in the case of kind of data exfiltration. So that's a quick overview on us. And um, what we are going to do now is actually introduce Matt. And so Matt is our joint customer from Tableau, and he's going to talk a little bit about his um, deployment experiences with Jamf and Code42. Yeah, thanks, Amy. This is Matt Peterson with Tableau Software, and uh, give you a little background on who Tableau is and then myself. Uh, Tableau is a software company producing inter interactive data visualization products. Um, we have on-prem cloud and mobile offerings. Um, we've been with Code42 as a customer since 2015, and uh, we're based in Seattle. have over 300 crash time licenses in use. Um, we're 100% or 3,000, sorry, <laughs> for 100% Code42 cloud and, uh, and on, with an on-site master appliance. Uh, we are also Jamf customers, of course, and I couldn't actually tell you how long that's been. It's been enough years that uh, I believe maybe at least four. So um, we're deployed to over 15 global sites um, in terms of crash plan, and we have a mix of about 75%, 25% uh, Windows to Mac for our um, end users' machines, and that includes laptops, desktops, and what have you. Um, we are using crash plan currently for, obviously, for backing up. We also use it for legal holds as well as migrations, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, my role is uh, that of an IT project manager, so I support technical operations and implementing new technologies and supporting some of our existing technologies. And uh, I help support the implementation and operational aspects of Crash Plan from basically from proof of concept all the way now into production. All right, so basically, uh, choice between platforms at Tableau has evolved over time. We began in the earlier years of startup as a you know, Windows-only shop, 
uh, just for simplicity's sake, and um, you know, there's some there's some other reasons there, but without delving too far into that, uh, it became obvious within short order that there was a, a use case for MAC endpoints, and that kind of manifested itself in a couple different areas um, initially, but. First and foremost, it was marketing for kind of their video production and, and photo editing use case. So they were the first to adopt in large part the Mac platform, uh, followed later by our developers. Um, and there's some obvious use cases there, you know, making sure that Tableau Desktop works on a Mac just as well as it does on a Windows machine. And, uh, and then uh, lastly, the IT team, which is me and, and my guys basically, we have to support all those internal customers, so we of course then up adopted Mac so we had expertise and could, could share the user experience with them. Um, there are now several other departments that offer a choice on some level for Macs or Windows machines. And as a general rule, we allow our employees up to three endpoints per person, so someone could have, you know, a couple Windows machines, could be a desktop laptop, and then um, uh, a Mac laptop or something. So that doesn't even include virtual machines, and we could go down that road, but there's lots and lots of those. So um, that's kind of the standard that we have here, and if, a, if there's a non-standard application for a Mac, you can actually go and get director approval and you know, you can hopefully procure, procure your Mac instead of having to be stuck on Windows if that's something that is tough for you in your job. Um, I'll, I'll throw this in there. We also have a few Linux in our environment, but uh, not the focus for today. So right now we're at 1,000 Macs, so you can kind of understand where our footprint is there. So when we were planning out our deployment for Crash Plan to our organization, uh, we had to take into account a, a number of factors, and I just want to highlight some of those that are pertinent to this discussion here. Um, it was really important to us and to our leadership to have a, a smooth and silent deployment, essentially. So we wanted to get the application out to the end users without them knowing it's there, and then once it was out there, we could report victory and say, hey, guess what? You have this thing on your machine now, and it's pretty neat. Um, so, that took uh, some pretty extensive testing to make sure that, you know, we could proof it out and, and you know, turning off certain notifications when uh, the application was pushed out to machines and both the, from the SCCM and JAMP consoles because we used both of them. And, and again, I'll, I'll elaborate on that here shortly. Um, speed was also a pretty big consideration for us. When we adopted Crash Plan, it was, um, it was a directive from our executive level. So there was some urgency in getting our, uh, getting our backups baselined and kind of limiting that, that risk that we had for any longer than we needed to in, in terms of losing data and that sort of thing. So um, at the same time, we didn't want to push too fast to deploy and risk, you know, taking down a segment of our network or risk um, hindering end user performance on their machines. So we had to kind of balance that. So there was a little bit of give and take there. And, once again, I'll, I will reference that here in a minute. Um, we also wanted to make sure there was a consistent experience between the Windows and Mac users. So um, their experience in, in working in the software as well as how it would install and you know, begin backups initially. So we tested just to make sure that, that there was parity there between the two deployment methods and the two platforms and found it actually pleasantly very, very similar. So um, one of the other things we just noted was to make sure we had the same uh, version of crash plan being deployed across platforms for, you know, for our baseline deployment. We didn't jump to any newer versions for any segment of, of users. So that was actually pretty helpful because that can cause problems. Um, and lastly, we wanted to be able to measure and show our success rate for deployment and the success of the install of the application. And we did that a few different ways. Um, we were able to see, you know, how much bandwidth utilization or how much of our circuits we're using site by site through, at the time we're using Cisco Prime infrastructure for that or CPI. And from an endpoint 
standpoint or from a, a management console standpoint. We used actually CrashPlan, the console there, to see what users um, were being brought in and showing up and backing up in there successfully, as well as SCCM and Jamf. You know, you can you can view the success or failures of uh, of your deployments in, in those two consoles as well. So get a little bit more detail, go to the next slide here, and kind of talk about a few different considerations that, that came into play. So um, one, of the, one of the first things that we wanted to make sure was that we didn't overwhelm the circuits that we had at each site, as well as you know, our users, and depending on what locations they're at. Um, you know, there's some bandwidth considerations there, and so there's some throttling features you can adjust at crash plan, which is great. Um, we also discussed our backup configuration, so that's, you know, your targets and exclusions and, and whatnot on the endpoint in terms of, you know, what you actually want to protect and what you intentionally don't want to protect for various reasons. Um, there's also a lot of um, considerations in terms of the differences in how, at least in our environment, how SCCM and JAMF work. Um, you know, I'll talk more about our environment here in a minute and, and why we had to consider those things differently, but, you know, being completely different pieces of software with, you know, similar purpose, uh, you know, we had to make sure that we, we were able to deploy consistently across both platforms. And then lastly, um, and pretty much least, was the difference in user experience um, and support differences on the two platforms. And I say least because that was actually a, a minor concern because it is so similar. So we'll go next slide. So to deep dive into the bandwidth throttling a little bit here, um, basically we just had concerns about, again, overwhelming the circuits at each, at each location, um, limiting productivity of our users um, for their normal business needs. And so what we did was partnered with our network team to make sure that we had appropriate settings for each region, for each site, and um, throttled accordingly. So that, that helped a bit. And then, you know, really the biggest help was to limit our speed or our, our scopes for deployment to, to the endpoint. So, you know, in our case, we used IP subnets to throttle the actual deployment because once you have the application on the endpoint, it begins its baseline backup, which is the biggest push of data that's going to happen um, in your organization at any given time. So. We wanted to make sure we didn't go to too many endpoints and, and actually, you know, overwhelm the site, like I mentioned earlier. So we started with smaller groups and kind of dipped our toe in to, to check the temperature and monitored that to see what it would do. And we, we found that was an effective approach to um, limiting our risk there. So there's also considerations for your home users. Um, home users or remote users uh, just depends on, on where they're at. Uh, but uh, certain individuals who work from home primarily and, you know, maybe get reimbursed for their uh, internet service provider bills, some of them have either really limited bandwidth or throttled bandwidth. So you have to be careful about, you know, pay per, uh, I guess the pay per megabyte kind of approach to those things and, you know, build in some exceptions that work for your organization. So that was relatively easy to do as well through the crash plan. Um, management console. So we were able to handle that um, without too much issue. Um, and then one, one thing that came out of this, which was um, interesting just from having been so involved with controlling the speed of upload-download, is we were able to put in a policy for one-off situations where we needed to restore someone quickly, um, whether this is an executive level person or, you know, maybe a high value activity that they need to do. They lost their machine, it got stolen, it crashed, whatever. Um, we're able to uh, manually lift the bandwidth restriction on that machine and really push data down to them so they could get the files they need as fast as they needed it. So we'll move on from bandwidth from there on to the next slide and talk a little bit about uh, backup configuration. And there's not, you know, you wouldn't think there's a whole lot to actually configure because it's like, you know, the application goes out, it backs up your data, what is there to worry about? There are some nuances that, you know, if you don't consider these early, you can wind up in a little bit of a political struggle uh, trying, to, trying to target what you want and exclude what you don't want. And there's a little bit of um, 
a little bit of negotiation that needs to happen or that I recommend with your, you know, your leadership and specialized teams like information security and maybe your network team. Um, part of the consideration is going to be based on your risk tolerance and that comes into play in terms of, you know, how much traffic do you want versus how much, um, how much do you want to exclude. Um, there's also there's also some other considerations when you go into the cross-platform discussion, which is, you know, what we really want to get into today. We're not, you know, we don't back up the operating system, you know, as per recommended by CrashPlan, of course. Um, we're really targeting the user profile. And, you know, that has, the user profile for our machines, you know, obviously there's a different file path for that. But with the advent of wildcard prefixes and whatnot, it's really not that tough to target what you want. Um, and, you know, make considerations for varying software applications on each machine, like so your, your parallels versus your Windows VMware workstation that you, you, know, you don't want to back up your VMs necessarily. So you can, you can easily flesh that stuff out with, you know, kind of working with, working with your IT teams and making sure that they're informed about what kind of work you're trying to do in terms of configuration and getting the right backup target. Um, another simple one is to just make sure you exclude things like Dropbox or OneDrive, if those are um, if those are considered uh, sanctioned by your your company, then you know they have their own method for backing up. They're already using traffic on your network. Um, they're already using some amount of hard drive on the machine. So why double back them up? So we'll move move a little forward from there. So let's get into some of the differences between SCCM and Jamf, and I'm going to preface this with just a little bit about um, very high level about our environment, how it's structured, which limited us in some ways. So um, there are, at least for us, there were some definite advantages from the Jamf console over SECM. And largely that has to that has to do with a couple items. So for us it was the distribution points and where they're located. So for our for Jamf, we have you know we've got a cloud distribution point. We also have local ones here at our you know headquarters to kind of speed things up locally. But having that cloud distribution point makes it really uh, much more reliable, much more predictable. Uh, no VPN access or internal access to the network required to get your um, to get your crash plan you know application installed on your machine. And the nice part about that is when we scoped in a certain amount of users for either a site or a group of people, we could kind of count on them getting the application within a certain amount of time. And that was a much shorter period than with our SECM client, for example, because that actually uses, in our environment, local distribution points at each office. Um, it requires, you know, that the user be VPN in, you know, they've got to check in, and then it's, you know, going to do a, a check and make sure, do you have crash plan? No, if not, then, you know, it, it gets pushed down. And for some of our remote users, that was a rare occasion where, you know, they may not connect, they may not come into an office, they may, you know, maybe don't even use a VPN as readily as some folks. So there was a, a much better success rate with Jamf in our experience. Um, there's also, you know, the consideration that we're, you know, there are less Macs out there in the wild. But um, if you just go purely on percentages, we had a uh, more predictable and smoother process on that side. Um, one of the things that kind of comes to light here is that these are different disciplines, and so when you're when you're working with your teams to to get your deployment plan put together, you know you're going to interface with different people between the SECM and the Jamf teams. And in our environment, that's a that's a person. It's like the SECM guy, right? So. Um, in that case, I think it's important to just make sure you have a unified message uh, in terms of, you know, when you want your collections to be deployed out. So that's, that's one of the things that, you know, I found from a project management and timing perspective that, that was a bit of a challenge was just the predictability of when they would push the button and say go. But um, just an extra layer of communication to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, the, the application itself, there are so minor, such minor differences in the the UI and the UX that essentially there's not a lot of um, extra labor or overhead in terms of covering both platforms. So 
I kind of alluded to this earlier, but to give a couple of examples, you know, the platform or the, uh, the version that we deployed originally had a difference in like how to pause your backups. And it was just a term, you know, just a time amount of like, you can do it for one day on the Mac platform or your option on, on Windows is like two hours or something. Or, um, you know, just to give one example, and that's probably changed um, on newer versions or maybe there's reasons for, for it being different, but it's so minor that you can mitigate that with end user documentation and a little bit of help desk nudging. Um, we did a lot of different documentation between um, internal and external facing just to make sure we could kind of minimize our, our overhead in terms of questions and tickets. So we can move on from deployment differences with that. So for our migrations, uh, we have a couple different use cases. Um, the most common is typically just upgrading on the same platform. And as you might expect with CrashPlan, you know, that's the primary, that's the primary, uh, I guess, example for using, using it for a, a migration of data. You can restore the data to the same location, same file paths on the same platform. So Mac to Mac or Windows to Windows. So the much more interesting story comes into play when you're talking of migrating from a Windows to a Mac or vice versa. And there's a few different ways that you can get data from one machine to the other. Um, we don't, in our environment, we have not used the cross-platform migration tool that's available. Uh, we haven't had a use case or a, I guess I should say like a, a large migration that kind of all occurred at once that necessitated us doing that. Um, but that is out there, and I encourage you to um, get more information on that from the Code42 team. In terms of our use cases, usually we'd have a person saying, hey, I want to either add a Mac to my existing quiver of machines, or I would like to migrate from Windows to Mac, you know, and, you know, that, that whole process involves a few different, um, a few different requests and approvals, but at the end of the day, it's still a matter of setting them up with our standard image and getting their data moved over. So our desktop team would offer the, offer the customer, in this case our internal users, the option of either a you know, USB drive or moving their data up to a shared network drive if it wasn't too much data and that wasn't going to take too long um, for their new machine. Or we'd offer them the option to just download the files, you know, kind of a self-service approach from CrashPlan that they wanted. You know, they could go in and select the other machine and pull in what they want and not what they didn't, and away they go. So that's kind of the more common, um, common case is that they would just pull it in from, from the console itself. But really not a lot of overhead there. So moving over to our end results, I guess, you know, kind of looking back on things and kind of where we stand now. At this point, we have somewhere around the neighborhood of 95% of our, our backups completed and um, now protected from, you know, the risk of loss and rework and all those good things that management likes to minimize. Um, so, you know, costs have dropped and the risks have dropped and our end users are now happier because they can self-support instead of having to go through the process of putting in a ticket and waiting and when do I get my machine. Now we can turn machines around faster. Um, we can get you migrated to the other, you know, the Mac platform faster because we don't have to sit here and move every bit of your data. You know, you can start that process. It'll restore while you're working. It's a, it's a really nice experience. Um, the other nice thing is just the, like I mentioned earlier, the parity between the platforms and the simplicity. The users don't have to relearn how to use CrashPlan. Um, you know, what was true on, on Windows is still true on Mac. So that's nice as well as a support standpoint. You know, it's the same experience for our guys in IT to, to get people, you know, the support they need and on, on the uh, software itself. Um, it also helps simplify that whole device migration process. You, know, you can explain it to an end user who's maybe a marketing person, knows nothing about tech, and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I'll just go ahead and do it myself. So you know, at, the, at the end of the day, your employees are happy, you're saving money, that translates to the bottom, bottom line, and you know, execs love that stuff. So um, with that, I'd leave you with a few recommendations um, in terms of you know, what we learned. And 
The first one, and I've kind of, you know, I've kind of gone over these or touched on them on some point or another, but it's important, I think, to partner early with your network, your InfoSec team, your help desk teams, and make sure they're in the fold, in the communications. They get to help test and POC the software. They get to try it on Mac. They get to try it on Windows. They can help, you know, vet out your documentation and make sure that, you know, it does actually reflect what reality is. Um, a really huge one here is to try, if you can, try to get policies, you know, backup policies on, you know, this is what we back up, this is what we don't. And um, that will help with the end users and some of the tug of war that may happen here and there. Um, it's, I think, I, I've also mentioned this already too, um, it's pretty important to make sure that your standard images are this, have the same crash plan versions. Uh, we did run into at one point, we ran into a time when we were trying to upgrade our Mac environment to Sierra, and the version we were on for CrashPlan didn't play nice with it. It was just too old, and so we wound up upgrading our entire environment to bring it all up to spec so that, you know, we're not dealing with kind of cross-platform fighting there. So uh, part of that is just testing, you know, does this version work on both platforms, and, you know, that brings to the next one. Test the nuances, you know, that, that you think might be unique to your environment um, and, you know, learn, take what you've learned and write it down, document it and help, you know, arm your support teams with that knowledge, um, arm your end users with that knowledge. And part of that is, you know, I'm skipping one, but part of that is documentation that actually is usable for them and has screenshots and shows, you know, the different menus between a, a Mac and a, and a Windows machine, you want to make sure that you're using the right verbiage for them because sometimes, you know, you'll get silly tickets for things. So um, I think that's, that's pretty important. And then kind of tying in with the initial policy, identify your data targets and your exclusions uh, more specifically. And that, again, can, that can become a political struggle. So you want to allow time for those kinds of things. And you can start doing that before you even begin your uh, your deployment work of crash plan that's you can start talking about all those things and and get them going so uh, those are the those are the big points I would leave you with and uh, I guess with that we can move forward on to questions all right, great. Hey, Matt, thanks so much for that. That was a great walkthrough uh, for anyone who's on the line here you can uh, send in questions uh, using the web the Webex tool if you don't see the little button hover your mouse pointer towards the top of your screen and you should see a little menu bar appear right there. Uh, to start off, I've got a couple of questions here that came in during uh, your presentation. So one question was, how do you know where a user is, if they're home or which office they are, so they get that right configuration when you're talking about the different bandwidth approaches? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, sometimes that is a struggle for us, or had been when we were deploying. and. Really, it came down to how accurate was our AD environment to categorize a worker's location. Um, we also had another database we used for that, but um, by and large, we would basically take the data we had from when they were hired, because that is, you know, they have a home office that's attached to them when you, when you bring them on board, typically. So we take that, use that information, deploy them, you know, get them scoped in, deploy to that group. If that say an individual is in there and they, they happen to be a remote user and you didn't know it or maybe they've moved, um, you will wind up not getting the, probably wind up not getting them the software and then you can go investigate further. Um, I think, you know, for us, we, we set our policies for upload download speed uh, by region and basically three big regions for us. And um, that was helpful because even if they were moving around in, say, Europe or whatever, they were still going to have the same policy and not be on the U.S. policy, which might be a lot faster to upload and download. Hopefully that answers the question. Right on. Thank you. Uh, another question regarding deployment. So when you're deploying uh, the crash plane, the utility itself, uh, are you deploying that with the configuration or do you have to do the configuration as a separate task? So that's deployed with the configuration, the, the policies and the um, exclusions that are built in that you set for the management console, they're handed down to the application. They don't actually go to the application, so the user will check in, basically sign into our environment once they have the application. It uses, you know, their single sign-on that we use, 
and it will, I guess it'll um, actually LDAP, it leaves LDAP to validate that they're, um, that they are from Tableau and check in and it hands down the policy and like, here's what you're going to get. So it's all managed, you know, from one point on the console. Another question here uh, regarding the migration example when you talked about using a USB uh, drive. If you're using a USB drive as part of the migration, are there any concerns about data protection on that USB drive, or how, how do you approach that? Yeah, there's, we definitely have concerns there, and there's, you know, it is one of the reasons why we prefer to use a network drive or um, to actually just restore data from the actual crash plan console. But in the case of a small amount of files that the user says, hey, I only need like X, Y, Z, and I'm just going to start fresh on this machine, they will hand them the USB. They would plug it in their machine right then and there at the help desk and leave that USB with us. So it's not like we're giving it to them, it's running off, or we're putting in the mail, or those kinds of things. We try to avoid, whenever possible, exposing any kind of sensitive data. Thank you. Uh, another question, in the, if, if, you've already, if you've had to deal with this, I'm curious, but how long would it take to get someone back up and running if their computer is lost or stolen and they need to start, start over from fresh? That's a great question. Um, and I will add the caveat that this would be on either platform. We could have a machine imaged and ready to hand over to a user. I've heard metrics as low as 45 minutes to an hour. And all the desktop team would do in order to get their data restored would, be, would basically be kicking off a restore through the crash client console. And then you let that happen while the user is doing their work. So um, unless they need to have everything downloaded and maybe you're shipping this machine somewhere, um, if, it's a, if it's a person who's face-to-face, -face, hey, I'm, I'm dead in the water, I can't do any work, it's, you know, we can turn that around as fast as an hour during business hours. Uh, from thinking about the Mac versus Windows platform, have you seen, so today we've just been talking about the, the backup deployment, but uh, aside from that, with IT operations, are you seeing any other significant differences in how those two platforms are supported or, or in use at Tableau? I think, I think what I've noticed, at least, you know, culturally and kind of like if you, if you think back to, I'm not going to call them the old days, but think back to the, the fight of that, are you a Mac or a PC? And that's why that was the title of that slide. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot less resistance between the two platforms now, you can really float between the two without um, too much of an issue in terms of, you know, relearning how to do your job um, or having software limitations where, well, we can't get this software on this platform. And so, you know, we got to make exceptions for Joe because he's on a Mac and, you know, send him this file and this version or whatever, PDF it. Um, there's a lot less of that. So I would say the barrier of entry or the barrier of um, mixing your environment has decreased. And I've got my Mac guy sitting here who would probably echo that same message, but, you know, he's a, he's a fanboy, so. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and the last one here, what was, you mentioned teaming up with InfoSec and Helpdesk. Did you find any, like, what was the big source of your internal resistance to uh, rolling out this backup plan across different platforms? Good question. Yeah, I kind of, I think I hinted at the underpinnings of resistance there, and I never really, <laughs> I never really wanted to air that laundry. So we have certain departments uh, that were resistive to having files on their machines um, of whatever capacity stored somewhere else, so backed up to the cloud. Um, and this was a point where we kind of just needed to realign expectations that hey. This is a work machine. Anything on this work machine is work related. It belongs to the company and we will back up whatever our InfoSec team deems valuable and necessary. And if you do not want certain files in the backup target, here's what the target is and just go ahead and move it out of that target. It'll live locally on your machine. Backups are your problem. Um, but at least that way, you know, we're, we're kind of giving them, you know, an out where they don't have to have certain things in our target and have it encrypted somewhere um, 
off-site. But that was the main concern. Um, I wouldn't call it a privacy concern necessarily, but maybe just more of um, the comfort level for certain folks. I, I didn't get into, and I'm pretty sure most of my team didn't get into specifics on, well, what kind of files are these and why would you be worried about that? Um, that was sort of moot. The way that we mitigated it was with a, a written policy that was handed over from InfoSec. We negotiated with them and that was really helpful to just kind of draw a line in the sand. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, one final question regarding the Mac platform. Uh, how do you handle hardware repairs at Tableau for Macs? Are you purchasing the additional warranty from Apple or do you do internal repairs? Uh, we use, I believe we use Apple Care. We're not, we don't have any guys with screwdrivers trying to open up these MacBooks. I mean, they look like fortresses. So um, we're, we're not doing that. We have, a, we've got coverage for that. Well, Matt, thanks so much. Uh, again, thanks to everyone who has joined us today to learn a little bit about how uh, Tableau is managing user choice and doing that uh, with Code42 and Jamf. Amy, I want to say thank you to you as well. Thanks to all the folks on, from Code42. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, you can learn more about Jamf at jamf.com. And of course, you can learn more about Code42 at code42.com. And if you're curious about what Matt, what Matt does at Tableau, head over to tableau.com and you can learn more about their awesome products too. So again, thank you so much. I hope that this has been a helpful session and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.